Good evening, everybody. Good to see you here this evening. Let's stand and sing our call to worship. Join me for Send the Light. pray together. Lord, we thank you for the light. Lord, we thank you for light exposing the darkness, God, and you showing us what we need to do through your word and, God, the power of the Holy Spirit. And, God, we ask that you'll do that this evening. Lord, as we study your word, I pray that you'll allow that to be a light to us, to apply it to our lives for your glory and for your honor, and for your glory and your honor alone. Lord, we pray for Brother Key, the ladies, as they lead us, and that, God, as we continue to look at Jeremiah and get back into the book of Jeremiah, I pray for discernment and wisdom and the openness of mind and the openness of heart, God, to apply the scriptures to our life. Uh, to be used for you and by you for your glory and your glory alone. Lord, we thank you for the blessings upon our church, and we thank you for what you're doing. We pray that we'll always remain faithful to give you the glory that you deserve. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening to you. As Brother Keith said, we're thankful that you're here and able to worship with us this evening. We're going to jump back into Jeremiah. Uh, we took a few weeks sabbatical because of different things. Uh, if you don't have a handout, you need that handout. It's one piece of paper. Uh, if you haven't been here, the previous week's answers are to your left out there. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of that. If you're watching online, you can print those off of our website. Uh, those are up there a month in advance. So if you want to follow along, you have a few minutes to do that. Uh, but we're looking forward to the study. Hopefully that you're ready to learn there and dive off into it. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of announcements. Just a reminder for Wednesday night supper, please make sure you sign up uh, today if you're here and you have not signed up to do so. Uh, also, the Fall Festival Saturday, 5.30 to 7.30 here. Uh, it's going to be a big event. We're looking forward to it. Uh, you know where you're supposed to be and the time you're supposed to be if you are participating in that. Uh, if you have any questions, Lindsay McGuffey can answer those for you, but we're looking forward to this weekend uh, and what the Lord's going to do. Uh, does anyone else have any other announcements that need to be made? Anything else? All right, we're thankful that you guys are here. I will go ahead and mention one thing. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I think two weeks from the day, Messiah's Men, I think it's the 27th, and my math is right, uh, will be here during our PM service. So if you'll be praying for uh, that guy, uh, Les, and Jerry. I was thinking Homer. I'm, uh, I didn't, I'm glad I didn't call you Homer. That would have been bad. That, that would have been bad. I'm sorry there. But Les and Jerry and Homer, and uh, Brother Danny will be here with us in a couple of weeks. So if you'll be praying for them. It, it's nice to meet you too. I just realized what you said. Uh, but if you're praying for those guys and making a point to be here, uh, I know they would appreciate that. But we're thankful that you're here. If you, if you have not gotten the handout, you got a few minutes to go grab one. And uh, as soon as Brother Keith and the ladies get their leaders in this song, we're going to jump off into, into the book of Jeremiah. Okay? Thank you. <clears throat>
Let's stand once again as we continue to sing. Join me for uh, one of my songs. It's a very simple song, but it's one of my favorites. It simply says, Shine on Us. Lord, let your light, light of your face, shine on us. Lord, let your light, light of your face, shine on us, that we may be saved, that we Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us all come here and worship you. Just let this offering go to the needs of your people. Amen.
All right, a few weeks ago we began looking at the anatomy of hand, uh, the book of Jeremiah, and uh, we're going to continue looking at that this evening at the second part there. Let's go ahead and set the stage, if we may, uh, of what this message is going to be all about, and it's simply this. The God who committed never to leave us is the same God who committed never to leave us in sin. The God who committed never to leave us is the same God who committed never to leave us in sin. Let's be honest. Everybody in here has experienced young love at some point in your life. Uh, you remember that individual maybe in elementary school or junior high school, or maybe you're in the middle of this right now as a teenager. This is one of Jeremiah's early sermons. In the introduction of the sermon, he describes young love in a very poetic way, in a way that gets his point across. But the love is not between two people. Uh, the love is between uh, Judah and God. And if you know the Scripture, you know this metaphor is woven all throughout the Scripture in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And this idea is that God is the husband and his people collectively are his bride. And this passage describes when the love was new, when the love was fresh, and when the love was excited. But now they are no longer newlyweds. But God remembers when they were. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, says, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase, all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. This passage describes how they felt about each other. When they were newlyweds, the bride was fully devoted in verse 2. God the Father, the, the, bride, the groom, remembers something specific. He remembers when they were in the wilderness. Things were not perfect. They had their moments. They struggled. But on the whole, God's people remained faithful until Joshua led them out of the wilderness and into the promised land. Those were the good days. In fact, God's people were so committed to God that they made an oral covenant with him before entering the promised land. They told Joshua something very important in Joshua 24, 24. The people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice we will obey. That is complete devotion. That is realizing the importance of God. The generation that entered the promised land had seen the fall of Jericho. They had seen the tragedy of cheating on God, but yet they saw his faithfulness and his steadfastness. They had seen the sun stand still so that God could fight for them. No wonder the people, the nation of Israel, loved the groom so much. And as for God, he felt the same way. In verse 3 of Jeremiah 2, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. We looked at this Wednesday night when Israel would harvest grain. The first fruits were set apart for God. It was dedicated. It was consecrated. It was holy. It was with purpose and it was set aside. It was so special that if someone came along and ate some of what was to be dedicated to the Lord, he was guilty. So God says, in effect, all the world is mine, but you, my love, are special. You are the consecrated part of the world. In fact, if anyone touches you, disaster will come upon them. And God meant it. God meant it because he could do it. These were not empty words. God is not boasting. He really did wipe out nation after nation before his people. He really did make a way for them. He really did drive out anyone who came against them. What a man. What a husband. He was their husband. He and his people or his devoted bride. But then we have an issue. It's shocking that God would bring up something that is not talked about, and that is our point this evening, the anatomy of divorce. The anatomy of divorce. Verse 8 of Jeremiah 3 says, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery. I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. God in this moment is sending his decree of divorce, and the reason is simple, because the bride was adulterous. 
God cannot be blamed for wanting to be out of the relationship with this bride, Israel, because Israel had been unfaithful to him. It was predictable. When people part ways with God, it often follows a pattern. And that pattern is simply looking at this anatomy of divorce. We tend to do something. We tend to forget what God has done for us. We begin to forget or tend to forget what God has done for us. Verse 5 of Jeremiah 2 begins, Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that ye are gone far from me, and have walked away vanity, and become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and of shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled the land and made my inheritance an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after the things that do not profit. God said he remembered the way things used to be. He references that to the prophet Jeremiah in verse 2. But Judah had forgotten. Looking at the verses that we, re-read, we just read, not only did Judah forget, but the leaders had forgotten. They had forgotten what God had done. God had delivered them from the oppressive hand of Pharaoh. They forgot that God had led an entire nation through the wilderness. They had forgotten about the fertile land known as the promised land that God brought them into. In fact, the rulers who were to have this in the forefront of their mind no longer knew God, praised God, or worshipped God. And we know that the shepherd is tasked with leading them to God, but they were leading them to false God. How did this happen? How did the nation of Israel get where they had gotten? Because the national leaders did not lead in the truth. When we make mistakes because we're out of the will of God, we're not focusing on what God wants us to do. And so when Joshua defeated Jericho, he took the law and he read it to the Israelites in Joshua chapter 8. And it says this in verse 34. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, and according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded with Joshua read, not before all the congregation of Israel, with the women, with the little ones, and the strangers that were covenant or conversant among them. Joshua was there. When God had given the word to Moses, he knew that God wanted to relate to his people. He knew that God was faithful. Yet the law of Moses was forgotten. Josiah, about 700 years after Joshua, rediscovered the law and read it to the people. And Jeremiah is ministering during the time of Josiah's return reform. And he's trying to remind them of the way that things were and what God had done. And exhort them not to forget God. If the word of God is not prominent in people's mind, they forget that God has decided to relate to people through his word. Don't miss that important statement. If the word of God is not prominent in people's minds... They forget that God has decided to relate to people through His Word. In other words, the Word of God must be the moral standard. It must be the guiding force. Jeremiah, in verse 8 of chapter 2, the priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. In other words, the leaders who were to lead the people to seek God through his law were no longer seeking God. As the leaders go, so goes the faith. As the direction goes, so goes the target. It's no wonder they got in trouble. It's no wonder they got in trouble with idolatry. They had forgotten what God had done for him. Perhaps the best picture of the ministry of the word in the life of the believer is found in Psalm chapter 119. And it begins in verse 1. It says this, Blessed are the undefiled, the ways who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those that keep his testimonies, that seek him with the whole heart. They also do not iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed. When I have respect unto all the commandments, I will praise thee with the uprightness of heart. When I shall have learned the righteousness, I will keep thy statutes. Forsake me not utterly. That passage in Psalm 119 echoes the passage in Psalm chapter 1. 
And it begins in verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the river of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. What does that tell us? It tells us about the blessed person. The blessed person is the one who obeys God's instruction. If you want to receive the blessings of God, be faithful to the instruction of God. Be faithful to the word of God. The opposite is also true. The one who, fa- who forsakes God's instruction is going to face the consequences. And the history of God's people depended on their responsiveness to God's word. And the same can be said about us. When they believed in God, faith, in God in faith, they prospered. When they rejected God's word, they were punished. When we believe in God's word in faith, we prosper. When we reject God's word, we are punished. The word is the source of life because in the word we find Jesus and in Jesus we find the Father. It doesn't matter how strong your historical confession is. If the word is neglected, the people are vulnerable. So the question is, are you in a position to hear the word of God explained regularly? Neglecting the word. Neglecting the word is not the end of the church. It is the beginning of the end. If the word is not at the forefront, we might as well not have church. If we're not going to preach the gospel, we might as well not have a church. The word of God stirs the affection of God. The word of God shows us that if it is neglected, the affections are not stirred. And this is trajectory, which means that there is soon no communication. And where there's no communication, there's separation And separation causes the problems. Not only do we forget what God has done. Number two, we find our satisfaction in something else. Jonathan, turn that back TV on for me back there. We find our satisfaction in something else. Once the memory was fuzzy, the heart longed for something else. When we forget what's happening, we miss the, the idea of what comes first. A heart that drifts from its love or a heart that forgets what love is. It's hard to say. However, we must remember that God's love is faithful. And if we forget that we have been loved by God, we will be looking for something else to fill that void. And when we look for something else, we see Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, that says, The prophets prophesied by Baal and followed useless idols. The leader had forgotten the power of Yahweh. And when the leaders forget the power of Yahweh, we displace God and other objects becomes our affection. And these leaders were designed by the prophets to be spiritual counselors, to mediate reform, to to right people's course, and were constantly reconciling the marriage. They facilitated the separation instead. Rather than focusing on what matters, they were leaning in the wrong direction. And so we need to understand our leaders, leaders who do not represent God's word to God's people. Leaders who do not represent God's word to God's people are facilitators of ultimate separation between God and his people. What caused this separation? It wasn't forgetfulness. It was idolatry. It was focusing on the wrong thing. It was looking the wrong direction. Idolatry is to forgetfulness what the sun is What the heat is to the sun. The presence of one means the other. And if we forget God, idolatry begins to set in. If we forget His faithfulness, we forget what He's done for us. And we have a wasteland of faithful forgetfulness. And we miss what God wants us to do. And He wants us to worship Him. And then we begin to worship something else. Rather than going to the Word and finding the Son and finding the Father through the sealing of the Holy Spirit... We go to other people or other things and other idols that lead us away from the trajectory of where God wants us to be. So how could they love a God they did not know? Jeremiah 2.13 says this, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have honed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. This summarizes the whole problem. They had forgotten God. And when you forget God and you go for other things, it's trying to hold water into a broken cistern. They have abandoned God as the source 
of life-giving water, and they dug leaky cisterns, and a good well could support so much more of life if they would focus on what matters. However, they were focusing and valuing the things that did not matter. And Jesus used this same metaphor to describe himself. Look at what he says in John chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up to everlasting love. Jesus was talking to the woman who was drinking from the cistern of lost love. She had been married several times. She was living with the wrong person. All of this love, quote unquote, and she was still thirsty. Thirsty for what? A void that only God could fill. Jeremiah is not preaching to individuals, but to a group. He is saying that these people have rejected God. It's the same said about us today in America. Could someone be saying that these people have rejected God? This pattern exists in all of us. If we do not remember all that God has done for us, if we are not exposed to the Word of God, then we will find ourselves dissatisfied. We want something else to fill that void, yet the question is not an individual one, but a corporate one. The question that we have to ask is about our faith. When God sees this satisfaction, number three, God files for divorce. God files for divorce. Verse 8 of Jeremiah chapter 3 says, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. God's people have been faithful for a long time, and God wants out. God says enough's enough. The question is, would God ever divorce the church for the same reason? Imagine a local church worshiping idols. What would that look like? Imagine that its members only had a casual interest in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The mention of his name stirred no passion. His, his presence evoked no excitement. They were never aroused by the power of the gospel. Although God had saved them, us, they had forgotten him. Things like being removed from death and hell, the victory that Christ would promise, and the love for Jesus was forgotten. The reason, as happened with Israel, is that the leaders of the church did not tell the people what God had said. They did not hold up the God of word and as uh, the Word of God. And as a result, the church members' affection went from the Word of God and began being stimulated by something else. They got excited about work. They got excited about family. They got excited about money. They got excited about all the things that God had provided, but they were not excited about God. But the ironic thing is that they kept all the things about the church. They kept coming. And strangely, they loved the things of the church, but they loved everything more than they loved God. Hence the reason of the nation of Israel. Hence the reason of many of us today. If you can imagine that, do you think... God would want a divorce? What if God was to say something? What would he say? I think he'd say something like this. Look, I really love you. There's nothing, I mean nothing, that I would not do for you. I am bound by my character to love you perfectly. But it's clear that you don't love me the same. And it's not just one thing. It's about years and years of you chasing all these other things except knowing me and living for me. I think we want different things. God says, I want you, you want the others. You don't love me. It's obvious that you never will. I want out. I want a divorce. I want to love you, and you want everything but me. Let's go our separate ways. But here's what the good news of the gospel is. God wants a divorce. But even though he wants it, he will not get it. God wants a divorce, but even though he wants it, he will not get it. Which leads us to our final point this evening. Rest in this truth. And it's simply this, that God will not leave us alone. God will not leave us alone. No matter how many times you mess up. No matter how many times you say the wrong thing. No matter how many times you miss the opportunity. God remains faithful. And even though he has the grounds for divorce, look at what the scripture says. 
Jeremiah chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> they say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him and become another man's wife, shall he return to, unto her again? Shall not the land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been lean with. And the ways hast thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholding, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hast a, a horse forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me? My father, thou art the God of my youth. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken, and done evil thing as thou couldest. Even if God wanted a divorce, there is an odd sense that he could not divorce his people. And the reason is simple. The law demanded that if you divorce your wife and she then marries another, you cannot remarry her later. In creating the law, God was trying to protect women from being proper to, property of being bartered or borrowed. God loves women, and His Word always protects them. So in an odd sense, God cannot divorce Israel because of two reasons. Why can God not divorce Israel? Number one, He made a covenant to always be with them. He made a covenant to always be with them. And before I give you number two, he made a covenant to be with you. Not just the nation of Israel. The new covenant through the blood of Christ is the same for me and for you. That he made a covenant when we accepted him as our Lord and Savior, that he was going to be with us for all of eternity. That he desired a relationship with us for all of eternity. So rest, Christian, in knowing that truth. Know that He's not going to leave you. Know that He's not going to forsake you. Know that He's not going to walk away from you. The first reason He can is because He made a covenant. The second reason is simply this. If He divorced them, He is bound by His own law that He could not remarry them. Divorce, then, is not an option to God. Aren't you thankful? You know how many times God can look at us, coach, and be like, you're done. Mr. Chris, you're done. Bobby, you're done. Les, you're done. So what will he do? This is good. Stay with me. We're almost done. He doesn't want divorce, but he doesn't want to be stifled. He doesn't want to be at arm's length. He doesn't want to be a convenience. So what he will do is allow problems in their lives that will cause them to see that he is the source of their needs. That he is the one to guide them and direct them. The problems are both at the hand of God and due to the natural consequences of their choices. Look at verse 19 of Jeremiah 2. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore... And see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. As we wrap this up, God knows that. Given the right opp opportunities and the right circumstances, they will think straight. And there are times that we as people, we make awful decisions. And we make awful decisions because we're not in the will of God and we're not seeking the face of God and we're not studying the Word of God and we're not listening to the voice of God and we're not asking for God to work in our life. But God knows, given the right circumstances, that they will understand that their cisterns are broken and that they need to seek out ones that will actually hold water. In other words, stop walking around with your broken cistern and pick up one that is whole and complete, that holds the living water, the one that's not going to leap out, the one that's not going to flow out, the one that you can hold and know this is the ultimate living water. The judgment is punitive, yes. But like a father, God wants more than just to punish them, to cause them suffering. When their, their only sustenance is God, they will see that He is all they need to begin with. And in that moment, they will return to Him. Don't miss this final statement. I'm going to say this and I'm going to pray and we're going to go. I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to give it to Brother Keith. When we see our only sustenance is God, we will see that He is all that we need to begin with. 
when we begin, I mean, when we see our only sustenance is God, we will see that He is all that we need to begin with. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that each person here this evening understands that. Lord, that you're all I need, that you're all that we need. Lord, there may be folks that are hurting because of their own decisions, hurting because of the decision of others. But God, may we be reminded of the goodness of the gospel. May we be reminded of who you are. God, may we be reminded that we have a covenant with you, that you're there with us. Lord, if there's anything else we're seeking in life other than you, I pray that you'll remove the change from us individually or collectively. Allow us to find our hope in you and you alone. Lord, I pray that's our prayer during this time of invitation, that our eyes will be fixed upon you, that we'll be filled by you and with you, and we'll be used by you. Lord, we pray this and we believe this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we pray. I can hear my say. God from